do it. It's go time. Welcome to Go Time, your source for diverse discussions from all around the Go community. Thanks to our partners for helping us bring you awesome pods each and every week. Check them out at fastly.com, fly.io, and typesense.org. Okay, here we go. So how is everyone doing today? And by everyone, I mean Chris and Johnny, who are joining me as co-host. Hi, guys. Hello. Hello. And Kayleen, our guest. How are you doing? Good, good. Is that Does that mean I'm like the person... I almost felt like that meant I'm being interrogated. <laughs> You're in a job thing. interview. Tell us about yourself and about your challenges. <laughs> Tell us about your, your pros and cons. Tell us a challenge that you had and how did you overcome that? How do you handle conflicts? What else is there? Generic interview questions. You represent all of neurodiversity. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah I'm like, I represent handling conflict by, and then I just like turn my mic off and walk away. I'm like, oh, technical difficulties. I'm so sorry. <laughs> but no, I'm doing really well. The weather's gotten pretty nice out here in New York City. So I've been excited about that going out a lot more. How's everyone else been? I've been great. Good. The weather is uh, is getting better in Berlin as well as we finally approach the middle of the year. <laughs> or past that, I guess. Did we pass that? No. It's the end of June when we pass that, right? Yeah, we're approaching yeah. there. At the end of June, then you're in the middle. Yeah. 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 But 10 days before you're at the equinox. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm getting annoyed by uh, New York City traffic uh, where people think it's okay to honk your horn at 3 a.m. And I'm just like, listen, jail immediately to jail. <laughs> what are you? <laughs> you got to be some sort of person to lay into your horn for two minutes straight at 3 a.m. in Manhattan. That is rough. Yeah. Wait, wait, Chris, you live in New York too? Yes. Oh, geez. Are you two neighbors? Okay, friends. <laughs> right, 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 right. Actually, I'm Kaylin, like, oh, they know Chris from New York. <laughs> I, I heard that car too. <laughs> it's awesome. It's like, oh, man. Oh, cool. <laughs> that's awesome. We, we'll get a drink later. Yeah. That's, that's yeah. Johnny, how about you? I don't live in New York, no. <laughs> and how's your weather? <laughs> <laughs> uh, weather's actually uh, quite nice. Um, you know, it kind of, it's making me feel like, you know, Getting in my car, you know, going to the uh, Baltimore Inner Harbor and, uh, you know, I put my feet up with a martini or something, you know, or something with an umbrella. Oh, OK. Yeah. Martini was not my first guest for Baltimore Harbor drinks. Yeah, I'd be going I'd be going like a mango margarita. That's what if I'd you haven't like. if you haven't been to Baltimore lately, especially downtown Baltimore, the Inner Har- Harbor area. Oh, man. Harbor East. Goodness. It's a whole different Baltimore. It's not. Uh, it's not what it used to be. It's not how it's not how it's portrayed in uh, in the TV shows. Nothing like that. It's, <laughs> it's a very different atmosphere. Very different atmosphere. All right, Chris and I will hitchhike with that person who honks their horn at three a.m. and we'll be there tomorrow. Hey, hey, you know, let me let me know. Let me know. I will be your host. I will show you around. Oh man, do, do a go time on the road. Yes, <laughs> I'll honk when they arrive. <laughs> Okay, so we're here to talk about neurodiversity. Yeah. What what is that? What is it? (laughs) The like pause. So the main reason I sort of have pitched some of this, I think other people have pitched you, Natalie, I don't know, maybe all of us have, is neurodiversity really just around like there's the so-called neurotypical brain, which is what in the past people would kind of orient their entire lives and society around like these are the expectations per se very hypothetical. It was very like, this is your average Joe Smith, Jane Doe type mentality of how we structure and how we expect people to operate in the day to day. And as time has gone on, I was actually just before this podcast, reading a little bit of the research, you know, trying to fresh it up. But uh, the DSM has been updating probably every decade or so. But in between, they released minor uh, versions of the DSM. And essentially, we've gotten more and more research about what neurodiversity means, and especially that it encompasses a brighter, a broader group of people than we definitely thought 20 years ago. Honestly, even 10 years ago, it's just been scientists have been learning so much about what makes up different diagnosis criteria. And so it's kind of just instead of neurodiversity being like a small niche 
group of people is becoming more and more of a large minority, you could say. So just kind of the ways that people's brains operate and the ways that they go through the world and perceive things is how I look at neurodiversity. But I don't know, Chris and Johnny, what's been on your mind? Or if it's literally only me, in my opinion, I'm going to get nervous really fast <laughs> if it's I mean, just me talking about it. <laughs> neurodiversity is one of those things I kind of look at and I'm just like, I maybe I'm telling on myself and my small group of friends, but like, I don't know if any of my friends are neurotypical. Like, I don't, <laughs> I don't, <laughs> I don't really know what neurotypicalness looks like. And I, I do think it's because I live in like a unique place. It's kind of like one of those like weird things about America, I just imagine, where it's just like, um, there's that interesting stat where it's like a huge number of white people live in places where only other white people live, but like people of color, like even the most populated, densely populated place with black people is only like 50% black. So it's like people of color, we don't live around like other people who aren't like we don't live around people who are only like us. Whereas like with white people, there's a higher chance that you live around people that are only like you. And I feel like maybe that's what it's like for neurotypical people where it's like, if you're a neurodiverse, you probably like interact with some neurotypical people, but mostly neurodiverse people. And if you're if you're neurotypical, like, I don't know, maybe you just only interact with neurotypical people. But I don't know. I just know for my me and my small circle, I'm just kind of like, you know, I think through my friends and I'm like, I think we all just have spicy brains, different flavors, right? All sorts of different flavors. But yeah. And I just think, yeah, I think as time goes on, we're just going to I hope at least for, you know, to go on, I do agree with like the way you've kind of framed it, Kaylin, about what neurodiversity is. And I think over time, we're just going to figure out that maybe the framing of neurotypicalness was a bad framing in the first place. And it's one of those like averages that uh, like nobody actually fits. It's like that whole, was that that story of like the Air Force and they were, they made their cockpit for the average person and it turned out nobody fit in it because there was no one that was actually average. So they put like an adjustable seat in. And I feel like that's probably where we're going to wind up with neuro, like diversity. It'll be like, yeah, everybody is a little, it's like a spectrum. And maybe the, the word will get rebranded. So it's like people on the further ends of the spectrum. It's like, okay, well, you're, you're the more neurodiverse and people in the middle will be like, you're typical, you're average or whatever. But I, I have no idea. Yeah, no, I think uh, your description is fantastic. But Johnny, I want to hear what you're thinking too. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm, well, I, I, don't have, I don't have a take on it. I'm, I'm, so allow me to play devil's advocate a little bit. If everybody, uh, to use Chris's um, scientific term, has a spicy brain, why did we feel the need to come up with a label for this? Like, why, why the the otherness? Why the specialty? Why why the branding? Like, is it e- because it makes it easier to talk about? Like, like what? Why? Ooh, that's a good question. So you guys are gonna have to be my buffer around how deep we want to go into some of this, because like most things, if you go into especially medical things, if you go into how they started, it gets reasonably dark pretty fast in terms of like the whiteness that maybe came up with certain terms, the colonialism that came up with certain terms. And I'm by no means an expert, but that's certainly a hint where a lot of it came from. Um, Certainly some strands of it come from when lots of women would end up institutionalized for various what things that we would now consider perfectly normal behaviors. But at the time, because it was an outspoken woman who was stating her thoughts, they would come up with terms to institutionalize her and say (laughs) she's different than the others. So it does have like a um, less than pleasant origin. And I also think that's where, to Chris's point, we might end up at the point where neurotypical ends up being a term that isn't really describing much of anything. And it is much more like, you know, the human species evolved to have different ways of brains thinking for a very intentional reason, because if we all thought the exact same way, we probably would have been extinct a long time ago. The fact that we have various people who think differently is not an accident. It's not like a, oh, gene mutation, that's a big issue. It's just you would have the people who specialized in going and hunting or going and farming or keeping track of what's happening. Even the people who would sit around night after night tracking stars, there's a lot around those civilizations thrived more because they would have those people just tracking the patterns associated with the seasons. Uh, and they didn't necessarily know all of that. So I think neurotypical does kind of come from this place of isolating somebody who might be different from the norm and finding a way to ostracize them out of society, which is not fun. And that's where I think a lot of like 
older generations have this fear of being called neurodiverse, fear of being called other from these past connotations with it. But more and more, not just like the DSM, but by psychologists and scientists are coming out with more reasonable definitions of neurodiversity in a way where it's, it absolutely encompasses way more people than we thought in the past. It's very much a spectrum. And even the things like what doctors used to do where you would only get diagnosed if you fell so far on the spectrum that you couldn't operate in your day-to-day life, that would be when they would diagnose you. Whereas if you could manage to struggle through, they wouldn't give you that diagnosis. And that kind of that can lead to a lot of burnout, a lot of issues for people, and a lot of that stigmatization. So that's like a short-ish answer. <laughs> there are some darker reasons where neurotypical came about. I'm not an expert in them at all, but it does. um, Some of that stigma comes from places like that where people got afraid of it. Yeah. And I would kind of say that, you know, I don't think people who fall under the neurodiverse kind of umbrella or on the spectrum, I don't think that we gave ourselves this label, right? I think it was kind of put upon us. It's kind of like the same, like the development of, of, of sexuality where it's like, you know, we can't, we had this term homosexual and then we eventually made this term heterosexual. Now this thing kind of sprang into existence that wasn't there before. And you know, there's all sorts of reasons why terms like this and labels and identities like this come into existence. But it's, it's definitely a mixture of things like, you know, from knowing history and having looked into this a bit, you know, Caitlin, yeah, there, there is a lot of dark history around this. I mean, there's a lot of dark history in medicine <laughs> in general, especially when it comes to, to women and, and how they've been treated throughout history. But you know, as we do start to actually kind of, I think that the thing about it is that the more that we try and define what neurodiversity is, and even the more we try to define what neurotypicalness is, the more that these things will kind of start to disappear. I think there are phrases and they are terms that we've only kind of had fuzzy definitions for in the past, kind of that I know it when I see it thing. And now when we're kind of doing closer inspection, it's fading away and it's starting to disappear. So it's, I think it's like kind of on this trajectory where it's like started off as this thing, as this basically way of othering people saying like, oh, your brain clearly doesn't function like the rest of us. So you're way over there. Like people that have, you know, severe autism or like severe ADD or severe ADHD or OCD or some forms of depression, right? You're like way over there and you can barely function. So we're going to give you this label uh, potentially to help you, but Mostly not. And then over time, I think we've kind of we're, we're in the phase where we're like kind of reclaiming that phrase and being like, no, we're, th- we're not going to see this as a stigma or a bad thing. But I think in the future it will kind of disappear. And like maybe 20 or 30 years from now, this won't be an identity or something that people are like, yeah, no, I'm neurodiverse. I think it'll just kind of be like, oh, like whatever. We might develop other words, but I think that because I, I got the sense you're like, why why do people call themselves neurodiverse? And I think it's one of those like reclaiming and ownership things, which, you know, there's always debates in communities about which words do you reclaim? Which words do you try and just jettison into the ether? And there's always arguments on, on from many different angles about what you should do. But that's kind of the I think that's the phase where we're in right now, which is just kind of the yeah, it's OK to be neurodiverse. It's okay to, you know, have a, a brain that's not typical with once again, whatever typical means. So is this, is this a self-diagnosis or must you wait for somebody to apply it to you? It depends. I think for a lot of people getting a diagnosis is the helpful thing, right? Because there's, especially when it comes to lots of different types of neurodiversity, sometimes they can present as other things that they're not. And especially if you like want to seek out, you know, medication or treatment, getting a diagnosis there is very helpful. But I don't think and this is always the problem with like communities of people. I don't think you have to get a diagnosis to be part of the this group of people I think some people severely disagree with that. I think some people want to say like, no, it's very important that you get a diagnosis. I think especially when it comes to things like OCD and the way in the past people have been like, oh, I'm so OCD about this. And it's like, that's, that is not what OCD is being like. And I think you're like, to some degree, people are like that, that's doing harm to people that have OCD. So I think it's definitely complex, but I think we're kind of steering toward the you don't have to have a diagnosis unless you're actually trying to get like treatment. And then it is rather important that you get a diagnosis so that you're being treated in the right way for whatever outcome you want to have from that treatment. 
But I think the more that we also, another thing, the more that we tie it up with like, you have to get a diagnosis, you have to get a treatment, the more it becomes this kind of negative, bad thing about your life, right? You don't get, you generally don't get diagnosed with good things. You generally get diagnosed with things that are like a problem that we think we should like fix or mitigate or change about you. Uh, and I think by and large, people that are neurodiverse don't think that there's anything wrong with them. So I don't know, Chris, I've been diagnosed with being good looking. So I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Who, who, what doctor did that? that maybe we should check. <laughs> that credential? Yeah, where, where did they go to school? <laughs> Kevin, I saw you were uh, nodding your head and kind of agreeing with uh, what was Chris, uh, what Chris was answering. Do you overall agree? Would you add anything else? Yeah, so I think, um, so I'm a person who has been like formally diagnosed actually twice in my life. Uh, once when I was around 16 and I thought the doctor was like a crock. I was like, nah, everybody's getting diagnosed with ADD. Like, that's dumb. So I thought, you know, me and everyone in my life all agreed that I didn't have it. And then during COVID in 2022, like that winter after everything started, I was like, okay, I'm not like, this sucks. Everything sucks. I hate this. <laughs> and I went back to a doctor. They were like, oh, so you have ADD. And I was like, what? And I was totally shocked. I like didn't understand. Did you like forget? or No, no. That was actually always in my head. And I went to the doctor very intentionally trying to describe anxiety. <laughs> like I was like, that's what I've got is anxiety. And at the end of this 90 minute session, they were like, yeah, yeah, anxiety, yeah, but like, I want you to think about ADD. And I remember being stunned. I was like, I didn't say anything. Like, I didn't bring it up. Like, I didn't go there. It turns out eventually the doctor sort of walked me through it where it was a lot of anxiety caused by various struggles with ADD. Uh, but when I talked to some of my family members, one of my brothers in particular was like, what do you mean you just got diagnosed? And I was like, oh, no. <laughs> so it turns out I was like maybe one of the only who thought <laughs> like that wasn't a part of me. So I've definitely gone through that. And it's been helpful, like really helpful. I guess I've gone through like apparently all the stages, including denial, all that kind of thing. But I do agree. So I, I think there's two points that I'm really keen on. So one is the tech industry and actually like scientists and even artists tend to have, and I, I looked this up and like there seems to be some research that supports this, more neurodiversity than other industries. That's at least like a common theory, if not something that might actually be reasonably researched. And so what that does mean is that industries like ours have an opportunity to more normalize some of these discussions and some of these ways of thinking, because you would expect that we just we have more people that think that way. And it makes a lot of sense when, you know, they talk about tech being out of the box thinkers, breaking the mold, trying new things. Those all heavily correlate with neurodiversity rather than neurotypicals being stronger at upholding existing patterns and following what's going on today, those types of things. So I'm really keen on that. That's actually a lot of what we've discussed a bit with the GopherCon conference, uh, but just something I find like potentially neat. The second part, um, I'm trying to remember, <laughs> it was what Chris, uh, Chris and Johnny were actually bringing up. Wait, what was it? I lost it. It was both tech and, oh, diagnosis. I do think the diagnoses can help, especially like what Chris was mentioning, where there can be a lot of things that seem similar. But frankly, the science behind this, as I kind of mentioned earlier, is growing quickly. Like they're coming out with new research. They're finding new symptoms. ADD, when it started in like the 60s, was all about kids that moved around a lot. It was like a kinetic thing. So they were just tracking like this person is physically moving in the space a ton. That's an issue. Eventually, they realized it was an attention disorder. So they started tracking that. More recently, in the last decade, they've really narrowed it down to a dopamine deficiency, which is why they've got all these new, like they talk about inattentive ADD, ADHD more, because now that they can track the chemicals in your brain that are off, they're like, oh, it actually shows up in all these various ways that are very specific. That's really cool. That also makes a diagnosis hard because if you talked to a doctor a decade ago and they were like, you don't have it, literally the research that came out later might contradict that diagnosis from the past. And so I think that's just exhausting if you're somebody who's trying to work through that to realize that like, maybe I should go get checked again. And it can be expensive. So I think requiring a diagnosis, not just in money, but also in time and just like that energy, especially if you're already feeling kind of down. So I'm very pro, like if you identify with a certain way of thinking, 
I think you should be included and allowed to partake in sort of discussions about it and learning more about it. I would certainly, you know, shy away from saying, oh, haha, that's so ADD of me or so OCD of me or, oh, I'm so autistic. Like those comments, if you don't have a diagnosis, I probably wouldn't like broadcast all over the place because that could be a little harmful if you're not positive about the like what you've got. But overall, I'm really pro if something resonates with you and as your kind of self-discovery, self-learning, if it helps you understand yourself and the world better, I think that's that's a big win. But it is. It's a very confusing space. <laughs> the doctors could be wrong or you could be, as I told with my story, like where I just was like, this person's not telling me good stuff. Um, so it's just tricky. And that's where I think it can all be helpful to kind of check out and include. So I, so I have a question. If what we're saying is that in our space, in tech in particular, we tend to be a magnet for neurodiversity. Does that then mean that amongst our peers, we're neurotypical? Right. This is like what Chris said. He's like, I don't know. Do I have neurotypical friends? <laughs> and it's like... I mean, I think God. like, yeah, you know, once again, it depends on how you, how you scope all of this, right? Um, I guess in a way, you could say... For my friend group, yeah, yeah, I'm neurotypical or like for the people I hang out with, I'm neurotypical. And the interesting thing is like groups of people will always find a way to differentiate themselves. It's kind of like how, you know, in communities of color, there's usually some level of colorism where it's like, oh, it's like, oh, y'all are a group of black people. And it's like, well, those people are less black than these other black people, right? You you kind of define into smaller groups of things. And I think that tends to happen with uh, neurodiverse people. Like if you're in a room with all neurodiverse people, then all of a sudden it starts breaking out into like, okay, well, what type of neurodiverse? Oh, the, all the ADHD people over there and you have all the people with OCD over here and you have the people that have like, you know, other dopamine deficiencies over here and some of the, so there's like PE kind of start breaking out into smaller and smaller groups. So I guess it, it depends on the group, but I, I think like there is a very strong mix within tech of different types of neurodiversity. There's a, there's a pretty large diversity in within neurodiversity. I would suspect, I don't have any research around this, but I would suspect there's probably a higher degree of autism or people on the autistic spectrum within tech than perhaps in other spaces. So that, you know, if you are on the autistic spectrum and you're hanging out with a bunch of people in tech, that might be more neurotypical than it would be in other spaces. But this is definitely the problem with words. They are very difficult to pin down and be precise about. So I think you bring up a good point there. It was like, well, why do we have to peg against society as a whole or the whole population? Does it make sense to do the whole population of like there's 8 billion people? Like, I don't know if you could actually find a neurotypical person out of 8 billion people. That's a very large number. Like, is there anything that makes a majority or even a plurality of those people similar? That's not like a kind of insufficient number, right? Here, here's here's where I'm struggling with this. And I don't want to come off sort of insensitive, right, to, to this whole notion and branding and labeling. I think, you know, have, giving a name to something and being able to talk about it, you know, with others that understand what you're talking about is is useful and important, Right. The because of the sort of nebulous definition. I mean, okay, let me give get some context. I'm already atypical wherever I go, right? I'm a black software engineer. There's a handful of me in the world, right? I already don't fit a particular stereotype or whatever it is, right? So to me, when you say that, okay, well, even within our own peer groups we seek to differentiate ourselves. So, okay, I'm like, well, nowhere is safe then for me, right? Because I'm gonna, I, I think that I think differently wherever I go and wherever I am, I'm gonna behave slightly differently as we all should, right? Because we, we're not copies of each other, right? Bringing this back by simply saying, hey, we now have a name for this thing. If you wake up sad in the morning, it's not that your, your dog died the other day, you just have a neuro, a mental deficiency of some kind, right? If you're angry because somebody cut you off, it's not like, oh, you know, this a-hole cut me off because they're a bad driver. It's because I have a mental deficiency. Like, like it's become so easy to just use that label to apply to any and everything, right? If you don't require some form of diagnosis from a professional, right? And, and that's that's the fear, right, that I have. Well, not a fear, but that's the concern I have with coming up with these terms, although useful, right? People can just be, I don't need a diagnosis. I can just say I'm neurodiverse. How do we deal with that? 
So even if you are diagnosed, neurodiversity is not an excuse for being an a-hole. So uh, if you're like, oh, I'm going to be a jerk to someone, you're a jerk. I don't care if it's because you're depressed or you have autism or you have OCD or you have AD. It's, if you're being a jerk, you're being a jerk. And it doesn't matter where you fall on the spectrum. Right. So I think that's like the first big thing of like. I very much don't like when people try and roll out with like, oh, I'm sorry I did that thing. I just had this other thing. Like, that's not, that ain't an excuse. Like, then it's like, I get it. You have, uh, especially I think sometimes people on the autistic spectrum tend to tend to do this where they're like, oh, well, I just like, I just don't understand. It's like, that's okay. We understand that you don't understand, but you still need to learn just like everybody else needs to learn. And we need to be able to like kind of exist within society, within each other and still treat each other well. So yeah, I think that, you know, that problem of people kind of self-diagnosing and then saying, oh, it's just because of this, that's not good. And I think too, if it's just like, I think at the end of the day, there are a few different reasons why you might want to identify as, you know, within the neurodiverse space. One could be because you do want to find people that are similar to you. So it's like if you are on the autism spectrum and you want to have other people that you can discuss it with. So maybe you can learn, you know, you know, improve your social skills or whatever. Or if you do have ADHD and you or ADD and you want to like have other people that you can lean on or just kind of talk to and be like, man, I wanted to get all this stuff done today and I did it. And people be like, oh yeah, I just understand it instead of a bunch of people that are like, wow, that's so weird that you couldn't do that, right? So it's like, there's that finding community aspect. There's also the, once again, as I said before, like the getting treatment aspect of it. So if you are waking up every morning and feeling depressed and you want to do something about it, then it can help to go and be like, maybe there's something, maybe there's something like wrong with they're different about my brain and I should go get diagnosed and get treatment and get help. And I think for a lot of people that fall into the neurodiverse space, sometimes you fall into depression because you're different and you haven't recognized that you're different. And just being able to recognize that you're different lifts you up in a way that now it's like, oh, now I'm not going to wake up every morning feeling bad just because I was, you know, all over the place yesterday. That's just how I live my life. And I just need to adjust to living life that way. So I think like that, that's kind of like the way I see it at least, but absolutely definitely like being a jerk is being a jerk. And there's like, don't do that. Like there's like, I don't care what your excuse is. Don't be a jerk to people. There's also like the hilarious flip of what you brought up, Johnny, where it's almost like if somebody experienced any emotion, any emotion, they're like, oh, I must have something. <laughs> and that's actually a hot take on what neurotypical means. <laughs> like, because like it can be like that, where like people feel like in order to you're supposed to just never have any feelings. You're never supposed to react to anything. You're always supposed to just be like, Every day is the same. I wake up. I have this breakfast. I go to work. And you could almost liken it to when uh, going gluten-free got really popular, but it wasn't with people who had the disease celiacs because there weren't as many of them. But it was with people that were saying, hey, we don't want to eat gluten. We think it might have issues. They didn't have that disease. But by having that interest in not eating gluten, they ended up creating so many like way better foods way better breads than before. Like a celiac person 15, 20 years ago had terrible food choices when they went out. Like it was just like you're eating disgusting stuff because the only things or vegetables, which is fine. Vegetables are fine. But like there just was not a lot of options by people gaining an interest in this area that they didn't necessarily medically need to have. It ended up becoming more inclusive for the people that do have celiacs. And I think that can be the exact same way with neurodivergencies where one, I just, yeah, I, I think it is very real that like, if you wake up sad and think I must be depressed, that's a bigger take on like how we as a society allow or don't allow emotions. It does not mean you're depressed. It could be a very normal emotion to be having, but it probably makes more people relate to somebody with actual depression and feel more sympathy towards them, even if they don't realize that they might be sort of co-opting the term. At least that's what I, I think I've seen more happen more often is that there are some bad actors. There are some people that are out flaunting like, pay attention to me. I've got this thing I want to let. And they don't. And they're just trying to get attention from it. But I think that's an, a more of a minority. And just the people realizing that, you know, you have days where you totally can relate to somebody where that might be every day for them. Those feelings might 
linger all the time isn't isn't necessarily bad, but it is it can be tricky in, in between there. But I think, too, there's an element of like, yeah, sometimes you know, I think everybody there's days when you wake up and you're sad and being able to, like, give people tools to help deal with that, I think is helpful, even if they don't want that label and if they are in every other aspect, like neurotypical. Like, I think one of the weird things about this space is that it's like there will be times in your life when you get depressed. It doesn't necessarily mean that your brain is different. It just means you're processing and dealing with something. And we want to make sure that people have the comfortability to go seek out help if they need it or have tools if they need them. So it's it's kind of like, you know, it doesn't matter. Like, who cares how you label yourself as long as you have the resources you need when you need them? Like, it's not like a, you know, if you want to, if you want to identify as neurotypical and that's what you want to do for forever and you're like, I don't think I'm part of that community, that's fine. But if you do get sad, you should have resources to like, you know, help you or you get depressed because depression isn't sadness. But if you, if you, if you wind up getting depressed or if you're like anxious a lot, it can also be helpful with that sort of thing, um, which kind of, you know, goes back to that thing I think we were talking about in the beginning of like, what even is this, right? I, I don't think that like, I think it's good for us to separate neurodiversity from the, the diagnosis and the medical parts because the tools that are available to people that have these diagnoses are generally useful, I think, for a much wider audience and they would help people a lot. I think it's like, I guess straying into some more maybe uh, controversial territory, but it's kind of the same thing that we're dealing with and going through with gender right now, where it's just like, you know, people are like, well, what is a man? What is a woman? And it's like, you know, if you identify as a man or woman, that's that's perfectly fine. But also you can, you know, identify as a man and then maybe sometimes you have other things. Oh, you want to wear something that's more feminine? Whatever. Go do it. It's fine. Like we can have that framework and that existence but the, the kind of overall structure that we have of allowing people to be themselves, that's what's important. And the same thing is true here, where it's just like, give people the tools so that they can, you know, kind of make it through life at the end of the day and kind of live and kind of reach their goals that they want to have. That was kind of rambly, but. So the one thing I'll add to this is that even if, so to me, there's a very clear line, if in case that wasn't already clear, <laughs> there's, a, there's a very clear line between somebody who who is thinking, right, they're on a spectrum versus somebody who's been diagnosed and has sought treatment and hopefully has overcome, if it's something that can be overcome, right? I, I know some folks who, with, you know, even within our, com our own community, right, as, as Go developers specifically, right, with a speech impediment, right? And they can't exactly just flip a switch or go to therapy and, and just turn that off and all of a sudden they're better. Like that's probably a long, lifelong, you know, thing. And I'm not going to even describe it, put an adjective to it, to it and say it's a good or bad thing. It simply is, right? So you have you have folks that, that are on that end of the spectrum where through no fault of their own, this thing is part of their life, right? And then you have folks on the other side who basically, you know, who perhaps haven't yet developed sort of the mental fortitude, right? Or haven't put in any work into, or, or haven't sought assistance, right? Having the resources, if that is at your disposal, right? If you decide that I am neurodiverse and that's just a badge that I walk around with at conferences, you know, a label, I'm neurodiverse. Like if that's your thing, then I think you're doing it wrong. And I think you're doing an injustice to actually those who actually suffer from some debilitating uh, condition, right? Like, and, and I say this, not from somebody who's speaking out of their, their other end here, like I have family members, I literally have a child who has gone through, right, this kind of uh, uh, um, problem, right? Be it a combination of being a teenager to actually being like actually diagnosed and, you know, seeking treatment. Like I, I've been, I have traveled that spectrum, my friend. So like I've seen that firsthand, right? I've lived with it. So to me, like I don't want... I would rather, right? I don't say I don't. I don't control other people, right? I would. I would rather, right? This didn't become yet some other flippant, you know, thing. People just, mm -hmm. you know, put in their on their Twitter bios and stuff, and, and just, you know, like walk around. I like get some sort of badge of honor. I belong to a club of, you know, fellow neurodiverse people because th that's not a joke. It's not a joke, right? To label yourself such a thing is not a joke. Ooh, that is, you're hitting such good points and difficult ones uh, that we've messed up so many times where like by trying to accommodate something, it ends up becoming almost like a popularity. Yeah, that badge, that badge becomes really big. So I don't have a strong answer, but I, I but it's on my mind. And just how you worded it was such a great way of expressing that. Like, that's a concern. That's a very real concern. 
when it comes to conferences, because that's where my mind's at kind of short term. And then even at employment places, we can, because I know, Natalie, you brought that up, maybe like cover that area too. Some things we're considering would be having rooms where, where conference attendees can go that are lower in stimulation. So like maybe the lights are dimmed or all the way off and it's very quiet in there and there's no noise. So you're just, you're just going to go in there and you're going to sit if you want to. And that benefits neurodivergent people who get overstimulated and need some downtime. It also can benefit literally anybody who's like a little tired, (laughs) which happens all the time at conferences. So that's where it could be targeting neurodivergent people, but it doesn't have to be exclusive and you don't need to put on a badge in order to go and use that. You do need to be respectful. You do need to follow the rules. If you're going in there and having a conversation like that's not okay, we would need you to leave. But I think trying to find the balance, I love that point around how do we make spaces both at conferences and at workplaces, more amenable to neurodivergent people without making it a show, without making it a, you need to say you have this in order to go do it and make it just more like you don't need to, you don't need to out yourself. You don't need to bring this up because while some people might bring it up for attention, other people might bring it up and get retaliation over it. So there's like just a level of, it'd be much better to not need that to be a part of the conversation and just have it be more of, If this helps you, that would be great. But I I loved your point. And I think that's where we want to try to find that balance of bringing accommodations, but not making it a part of the conference or the workplace or the show, so to speak. Yeah, yeah, I definitely agree with that. I think I think it'd be ridiculous to put something like I'm neurodivergent on like a conference badge or something like, please don't. (laughs) Uh, (laughs) Like, and I think that that's kind of the that's like kind of the place where I think the the bad side of diversity in general comes in, right? Because I think the the solutions, or I guess the, the things that we do to help people, I think as you pointed out, Caitlin, are useful to a very broad audience of people. It's like, yes, have some low stimulation places for not just, you know, people who, you know, get overstimulated and need somewhere to act, but maybe just for some introvert introverted people that just need a little bit of time to recharge or someone who just like wants to get a quick nap in because they're tired from a flight or because they're tired because their kids are there and they've been doing all this stuff and they just want to rest for a little bit. Like there's a whole bunch of reasons why you might want to use that sort of space. So I think the important thing is we make that space. I don't think we need to label it as that though. Like I think when you try I think I do very much disagree with the thing where people try and get the clout out of it, where like, especially a conference where the conference is like, oh, we are doing all of these things to help out people that are neurodivergent. Like, no, like, stop. <laughs> that's that's not great, because I do think it, it does start to make that thing into like a, a badge of honor of like, oh, look, like you're you're special if you do this. And I think for a lot of neurodivergent people, we don't want to be special. We just want to be like every, we we don't we just want to be like everybody else. We're like, oh, no, we're just people. We're a little different, but that's fine. Everybody, like in the most pedantic sense, everybody is different in some way. Like there's no two humans that are exactly the same. So I think that's that's important. And that's important not just for neuro no, neurodiversity and being neurodivergent. It's also important for diversity in general. And that's I think a lesson that especially our industry right now really does need to learn. So I think we are putting too many badges on things and being like, look at this, we're trying to we're trying to help with this. And I think there, there are extremes to this where it makes people feel very, very uncomfortable because it likely starts eating into things that people like expressing in the office space. For instance, one of the things that I, as a queer person, get very annoyed about is when people talk about their like fertility journeys or their pregnancies at work. And I'm just like, I don't need to hear about that. Please don't. But it's part of, uh, I think, a lot of workplaces' cultures to, like, celebrate that and celebrate parental things or even give extra benefits to parents that sometimes wind up disadvantaging people that, you know, are never going to be parents. So I think, like, you know, whenever you you label or you give something that it targets a specific group, I think you are inviting that kind of thing you were mentioning, Johnny, where people will just do it for clout at the end of the day. And we should avoid that. And we should seek out the things that will be helping a broader audience. Uh, and even if we do wind up helping out, like we're like, okay, well, we specifically want quieter spaces and we're specifically doing it for this group. Great. You don't have to say that. You just have to like provide the space. So I think that will help with what you're bringing up, Johnny, of the like, 
you know, the the people or like the the Rachel Dolezals of the world, right? The people who like are gonna go get the they're gonna be like, I'm part of this community because I think it's it's cool or something like that, right? Yeah, this is tricky. <laughs> That's what's going through my mind right now <laughs> is finding those balances and there's no like clean and easy solution to these problems, right? I think that's like it's it's messy, right? It's it's always gonna be whenever a group does try and take something that was historically bad and make it a a statement of pride, I think that there will always be people around the edges that do nefarious things with that or do weird things with that and just try like you're not part of this group, but you really you really want to try and be part of this group. So you're gonna shove your way into that group. And yeah, I agree with you, Johnny. That that is harmful to people. But also I would, I would, and this is me personally, I would rather we do that and get the resources that people need and normalize the things that are non-normal for some reason and deal with the consequences of having some clout chasers than deal with the situation that we've had historically where it's just like, you're just ostracized and deal with it. But that's, once again, my, that's me personally. I understand other people feel differently about the situation. I'm Jared, and this is a changelog news break. Device Script is Microsoft's new TypeScript programming environment for microcontrollers. It's designed for low power, low flash, low memory embedded projects, and has all of the familiar syntax and tooling of TypeScript, including the NPM ecosystem for distributing packages. This project has a lot of devs excited. Jonathan Berry says, quote, Dope. TypeScript for hardware. Always glad to see these attempts at bringing web technologies to embedded systems and see what sticks. Even when they don't, they inspire innovation. Zach Silviera says, quote, This is so much better than MicroPython. And Andrea Giamarchi says, quote, This is the first Esperino competitor, and I think it's going to be huge. You just heard one of our five top stories from Monday's Changelog News. Subscribe to the podcast to get all of the week's top stories and pop your email address in at changelog.com slash news to also receive our free companion email with even more developer news worth your attention. Once again, that's changelog.com slash news. So I want to ask a question from another perspective. As a conference attendee, who is neurotypical? What would you want to know about being better in sharing space with people who are the different types of neurodiversity? So obviously no stickers to mark anyone, as we said. So you just want to kind of improve your ways to be generally better in this way. What would you do? I don't have anything specifically down. I think that's a Really thoughtful question. So I love it, Natalie. I would expect nothing else. <laughs> but essentially how to make the place more welcoming and friendly, keeping in mind that there's people coming in with different ways of processing information. Because that's a lot of it. And when you're at a conference, there's a lot of visual stimulation of like the screens and the lights and the kind of like the show of what's in front of you. There's also the audio stimulation. And then there's like just a lot of the people I think probably the number one that I've seen, one like headphones, I've been kind of wondering if like that would be just a really great gift to give out more so that if people are feeling overwhelmed getting those headphones on so that they can have a little bit of alone space is probably a pretty good signal around just being thoughtful in that direction um, and not thinking that like if somebody's off on their own, oh, do I need to go necessarily engage them? There's this weird balance where you don't want to leave somebody out because they could be nervous and shy, but they also could be like, I could just use a little space. So almost keeping an eye out for that in a sense of not bombarding them and then also still asking them if they would want to come and hang out. Like if you notice somebody like that, maybe you just watch and see, are they alone the entire day? Then maybe you do want to go say hello and see like what's up. If they're alone for a little period of time, it might just be like helpful for them. I've actually been really keen. If you are a sponsor of a conference, I think, I feel like fidget toys could be really fantastic like sponsor gifts, little like puzzles to play while you're there, little things that can engage your hands kinetically or your mind a little bit can sometimes be a real like stress reliever or almost like um, an energy provider when you feel like you're sitting 
in one series, a long day of like you're listening and processing this way, getting a little toy that allows you to process a different manner via like a Rubik's Cube or whatever could be a fun gift for people. So that might be a way to just like try to think about sponsor gifts that could target neurodivergent populations and frankly everybody because a lot of people like little toys to play with. Those could be some cool ways to integrate and just like help make the conference experience more pleasant. I feel like I misunderstood the question. So that, Natalie, were you asking what, because the way I heard it was what can someone who is neurotypical that goes to a conference, what can they do to help make the space more comfortable? Pretty much, Okay, yeah. okay. So I did understand the question. I would say, and I think this applies more widely to diversity as a whole, is check your own expectations of things and how you perceive the world. I think what you brought up, Caitlin, where it's like, if you see someone sitting alone, don't assume that it's because, oh, they're just nervous and they don't want to talk to people. They might want to just have a little alone time. And I think it's okay to maybe like lightly approach them and be like, hey, like, do you just want to be alone right now? Or are you looking? And that will tell you real quick. Usually people are pretty good at, you know, being like, no, I'm just being, I just want to be alone right now. And they're like, okay, then you can just like leave. I think for conferences, one of the things I've seen at some previous conference was having a uh, Stoplights, basically, where you have red, yellow, green, and that indicates your desire to communicate and interact with other people. So I think that can definitely help. It's like a little sticker you can put on your badge and you can just put the red one on when you're like, I just would like to be alone and notifying people of that. And then just for neurotypical people, just being mindful of that. But I think, yeah, the biggest I think the biggest thing is just, you know, when you're in this space with people who are different from you, just remember that those people are different from you. I say I, I think the best thing that people can do is just be kind. Right. Just be be kind and be empathetic of how the people around you might be interacting or might want to be interacted with or experiencing things. I'm going to play devil's advocate a little bit. Go for yeah. it. Do self-aware and you're diverse people also bear some responsibility for the places they find themselves in or they put themselves in. For example, if I know I am, I get tired of people very quickly because, you know, if I talk to too many people for too long, I really need to, you know, like it starts to affect me. I can't function properly. Like, should you then, is it not upon you to manage that in some way, right? If I'm a conference organizer, do I bear the responsibility for making you feel comfortable beyond what I would normally do to accommodate any other group. Ooh, yeah. No, so the, uh, I've got a cool example on that. So COVID, actually, the fact that more and more conferences are having live streams of their conference at the same time. Fantastic for if you can't make it, you can still watch it. You can still be a part. Also really fantastic for if you want to watch from your room for a little bit because you know you can't do eight full hours that's a really cool way where making things more accessible for one group of people actually benefits other groups as well. And then it becomes like the conference organizers already did something fantastic. You did something that allows people who otherwise would have been so depleted with these 10, 11, 12 hour days to say, I'm just going to do, I still want to come. I still want to meet people, but maybe it's just like a half time. And I also thought, so we've talked a lot about like social battery if you you know get drained there's a different side, like some uh, neurodivergence, and especially people at conferences, and especially I think like presenters are the ones that are more keen to um, getting really excited and wanting to explain everything about their interest and being like, here's this, here's that, here's everything I love about what I'm doing, and I really want to share it with other people. And I think that's sort of, that's another way that it could be expressed that can be really fun at a conference. It could also be something where you're like, whoa, this person is bombarding me with tons of information about their specific niche, and I have no idea where this is coming from. That might be some way where you could be surprised by the interaction, probably less in tech. I think we're all a little accustomed to that, but that can often be like the special interest hyper focus. I'm so excited to share with others like me, and that's something that I'm trying to think through. How do we enable that? Because for a lot of people, maybe at work, they have to be more reserved. They have to be more polished in how they communicate. And they feel like they never get that chance to be like, I'm so pumped to talk about this specific spec with a bunch of other people that really care about this too. So like if we can find ways for them to share that joy, there's a lot of positive attributes that come out of some of these different ways of thinking too. I think um, that's a good example of just an alternative to the <laughs> I need. And, and I think a lot of 
neurodiverse people and everybody could use have moments of both where you're like, I want to be by myself. And you're also like, please, I cannot wait to share every thought I have about this really exciting thing. Uh, but those are just some of the ways it can show up. But yeah, I did want to call out that the the live streams just inherently make conferences more accessible to somebody that might not be able to have the stamina for the whole thing, which I, I love. I find that exciting. Yeah, I, I think as well. Uh, I do think, you know, you have a point there, Johnny, that like, if you if you are feeling overwhelmed, you should try and remove yourself from the space. And I think for the most part, a lot of people that are at least the people that are self aware of this, that they have, you know, that they're neurodiverse in some way, do make efforts to like actually like I'm going to go somewhere remote so I'm actually away. But I think there are many a times when you know this goes back to the like be thoughtful in how you approach people. There have been plenty of times where people that are neurodiverse that do want to get away and they are actively trying to get away and someone's like, no, come on, come to the bar with us, come get a drink with us, right? So that that can happen a lot as well where it's just like someone that doesn't doesn't really understand. Like, oh, no, no, that person just wants to be alone and someone's just trying to like, no, 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 come, be social. Like, oh, what's wrong with you? Why is it like that type of stuff, right? So there's definitely a balance here. But I do, I do think, at least in my experience, a lot of the people who especially with that specific thing where it's like you tend to get sensory overload and you want to be alone. Often, I'd say probably the vast majority of time, those people will seek out spaces that are further away from people and a little bit more remote. So, yeah. But I, I do agree with you, Johnny, that like, there, there is some responsibility. Like, it's not like, you know, we're not, like neurodiverse people are not helpless. Like, you do have to have some, you have to take it on yourself a little bit to put yourself into good situations but you know there's there's an extent to that right there's kind of like a, a not like both sides but like a, a a spectrum there so i want to use the last few minutes that we have to ask the same question in the context of work what maybe with the people you work with you know a little more than the people you go to conferences with so maybe you have even if not knowledge maybe a hunch if somebody was a more likely that to some point tell you that they're neurodiverse and so on. But until then, if you have a hunch or if you don't know your colleagues, a new com person comes in, like generally how to manage in space in the context of work. They have to tell me in what ways I can help. Simply telling me that you're neurodiverse doesn't tell me anything. Like for that matter, I'm neurodiverse, right? Or even a few steps back, maybe maybe somebody is not yet comfortable with you with even starting such a conversation. I mean, we've got to have a starting point, right? Like you have you have to be able to articulate, right, what your needs are. I can't guess them. Like if you, you have to somehow, you have to tell me something, right, as your colleague, right? And I'm not talking about, you know, as a boss or as a business owner or whatever, right? Not, not some corporate hierarchy. Like as your peer, whom you're going to be interacting with, you know, 99% of the time, right? Like I bear the most of the burden, right, of, of, Knowing how to, well, I mischaracterize it, not a burden, but I, I'm bared a, a lot of the responsibility since we're going to be interacting a lot, right? I have to, I have to find ways, right? I have to be cognizant, right? And, and be caring enough to understand how you communicate and how you and I can most effectively communicate. But if you don't tell me anything about how I can do that, then I'm, it's guaranteed that I'm going to be stepping on your toes all the way down. Are there some signals you can try to gauge? Oof. I mean, <laughs> I think I think I, I kind of I, I sit with Johnny in this where it's just kind of like I think there's there's kind of two options. I think there's one where if you're OK with and you're in a safe enough mindset, like you're in a comfortable mindset to be open with your coworkers about, you know, the fact that you're neurodiverse, then uh, I think that you should like be communicating with people and being like, hey, this is too much for me. This isn't enough for me. I think the challenge is when it's not a safe space, and I would say probably the majority of companies right now, it's not really safe to be super open being neurodiverse, right? I think we would like to pretend that it is, but it is it is not. I think it's way easier to be like one of the other marginalized communities and be out at this point than it is to be uh, you know, in that in that you know, the neurodiverse space. So I think in that case, it's not just on, you know, employers. It's, I think, also on other people to realize that, like, and this is, like, maybe this is an unpopular opinion, but, like, the, the professional environment should probably be a bit more, you know, professional, a bit more structured so that we can actually make it so that people can just kind of be themselves at the end of the day. Like, I think one of the things that comes up a lot, especially in tech, 
especially a lot of big tech companies, is like the drinking culture, which is not just like, you know, that this obviously is, does not just apply to neuro, neurodiverse people, but I think uh, it encourages like a higher level of socialization and we should kind of figure out ways to mitigate the consequences of not being social in that space. Like, I think that's like an important one. So I think, you know, at a conference, if you get a little exhausted, okay, no one's going to be like judging you about your next promotion based on that. But in the workplace, if you're not being social, then people can absolutely be judging you and be like, well, they're not a team player, so we're not going to consider them for a promotion or whatever. So I think, and that, that's something, right? If you're in that environment, right? You're not going to be like, oh, I have this, you know, my brain is different. That's likely going to make things worse, not better. So I think in that case, it's, I think, on coworkers and everybody in the organization to start making that environment one where, like, that's not like a requirement where it's like you don't have to be like going out for drinks with the guys in order to like get promoted. And once again, there's tons of reasons why that should not be the way that we, you know, make promotions happen in general yet yet <laughs> yet that is it does happen that is right? exactly yep. how it happens um and so i think like and this is kind of like my i guess my view on like the bigger broader diversity problem is that i spent way too much time thinking about this and kind of exploring this and trying to fix this at way too many companies and i think the issue is that having a more inclusive environment means that you have to make the normative kind of a wider thing, right? If you want to be able to include more people who are more neurally different than everybody else, you kind of have to regress down to like the meat. You have to go down to like the lowest common denominator there, which I think is tough for a lot of workspaces. Like once again, I'll bring up the whole like, People talking about their kids and their family and all of that in the office. That's like another thing that is very othering to many people and causes some of those same problems of like, oh, that guy just became a dad. Let's promote him and that sort of stuff. So I think it's it's like it's a it's a complex issue at the end of the day. But I do think like as you know, maybe if you are in the, you know, hegemony, as we tend to call it, or someone with a lot of privilege in a workspace, I think it is about like, you know, if you want to make the workspace more welcoming, to some degree, I think that's giving up some of the things that make you comfortable, right? And I think that's where the, you know, if we're talking about specifically about neurodiversity, where people that fall under the bucket of neurotypicalness might have to suffer some uncomfortability to make the space more opening, more inclusive of people who are neurodiverse, right? Once again, like, it might be that you don't go out to drinks with your coworkers as much, or you put in place a rule that says that you don't do it as much, or like actively making efforts to make sure that this isn't affecting people's career prospects. If you do go out for drinks, right? It's tough work, but that's the type of work that like I think, you know, people should do to help out their neurodiverse people, right? It's not just, oh, don't bother that person if they have their headphones on, right? There's there's work we have to do to fix the environments. And in fact, I think fixing the environments is the thing that's more important to do than all of these individual little things that I think we tend to want to do around diversity in general within companies, right? It's like the whole individual recycling versus like, how about we just don't produce things? Like how about the companies don't produce things that are unrecyclable or that are put the onus on the individual, right? The, indi the onus needs to be on the system. So I think that's kind of the place where we need to reach. And I think it's more important than anywhere else to do it in the, in the workplace, because that is where you are day in, day out. Yeah, I guess I'll end on like a, a plus one. And um, I think what can be surprising, it, people definitely don't bring up if they're neurodiverse at workplaces often. I, I, I wouldn't. Like, it makes me sweat to bring it up, uh, like, at all. I'm like, oh, no, this sucks. This is going to come back. <laughs> Someone's going to be like, you can't be trusted with this project because she has this thing and it means she's going to forget a detail type thing. Like, that That does come up and people start to stereotype really fast. The thing I've thought a lot about when we talk about what neurodiverse people are often asking for, I have noticed, because, I, I mean, I see it everywhere when I'm working with large groups and teams of engineers. You, I, I don't know for sure, but I feel like I can spot it a lot. Like, the people that are often asking, why are we doing things the way that we're doing it? Like, those people are the ones that really they're just pushing for more efficient processes, more transparency, really better business management. And where I've noticed the potential retaliation comes in is when management or more senior people say, maybe unconsciously, not directly, but they might say, like, your idea might be better, but, like, I don't care because it works for me. 
And what I've tended to notice is that there's a lot of broken systems in industry at in the United States period, let alone just in tech. We have a lot of ways of doing business that do not produce value, that are not working well. And I think a lot of times the people questioning that are the ones that we should be elevating more. And I think the thing that could be happening at workplaces to be the most supportive of neurodivergent people is being open to change. Not just change for the sake of being inclusive, but change for the sake of your business. Change for making it clearer who's working on what so you don't have six people on one project. That's not just helpful for people who get really frazzled at the like, I want to own my space and be able to create a result and show it off. That's bad because in some cases you just might end up not delivering anything because you created such a competitive environment for attention that nothing made it to the end instead of something more collaborative. There's a lot of like nuance to that answer, but I think in the in the workplace setting, there's a lot of value in creating an environment that utilizes neurodivergence and listens to them, not just because of their neurodivergency, but in fact, because they're actually really pointing out things that if you improved, you would probably just do better as a business. That's maybe a little overarching, but, I, but I've seen it enough where I think I've noticed that like at the minimum, maybe not implementing the change, but going through the exercise of hearing what they're suggesting and explaining why you're not going to do it would almost always result in a better outcome than dismissing the idea or sort of pushing it down, which I've seen happen a lot. But we'll get there. That's what I'm hopeful about in tech. <laughs> I'm like, I think, we, I think we're in a really good spot to have seen some of these challenges. Yes, at conferences, conferences are a little bit easier, but even in the workplace, um, I think we've got a, a, an industry of workers where there's a high population of people that are saying, I actually, I think we could do a better job. I think we could manage this differently. And I think we'd get better results. And sometimes they'll be right. Sometimes they'll be wrong. But figuring out how to move in that direction more, I'm pretty optimistic about it. But we'll see. I, I feel like for like one of the biggest things that companies could probably do to make things better is uh, throw away. I think I think mo lots and lots of people agree with this for lots of reasons, but throw away the rhetoric that we're all a family. Please stop. Like just please, I, especially since like yeah yeah we're in the layoff times. It's clear right now that n no, <laughs> this ain't a family. <laughs> we will not all be suffering together. That is not no 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 no. But I think you know that type of rhetoric is the type of thing that causes the the struggles and the harms, especially when it comes to, you know, inclusion. And, you know, Caitlin, I think you're right about the, the whole the diversity point. I think there's been, there's enough evidence right now that we can pretty, pretty confidently say more diversity, more money. Like that's just kind of how the system, how it works. Like we studied it over like the past five decades and it's like, yeah, more diversity, you make more money. Yeah. And that I think really includes neurodiversity a lot. Like I, f I believe in that strongly. I don't think there was much research on it, but like it already points in a good direction. And like if you find a way to tap into all the different ways that humans think, you're going to have more ways, more solutions, more things to sell, more ways to sell it. So that's that's probably the nice spin about the workplace. But I do agree actually with Johnny what you said around there's a responsibility both ways, maybe not to disclose like your title or anything, but definitely to disclose here's what would help me do my work better. I've had to learn more about that. Like it, it gets hard, um, especially if you don't realize, like it can be hard to realize that other people don't need the same things you do because you're like, this is so obvious. Like I, doesn't everybody have this issue? And then eventually you're like, oh no. <laughs> like, And that, that can be a point of, I just didn't even realize to tell you that because I just thought you were like, being wild, <laughs> just like not doing something so blatantly obvious to me. So there can be a level of that self-reflection and just learning, uh, observing how others are working and finding a way to say, okay, here's what works for me and here's what works for you and let's figure out how to work together. It's definitely successful whenever I've <laughs> done that. Those are really great tips. Thank you all for the answers. In a very sharp transition. Okay, so who has one? I know the episode had several sprinkled in. I do, but I'll, I'll, I'll hold off. Mine might be a little controversial. No, go for it. Go for it. Go for it. Okay, fine. 
you're not owed a great place to work. That was not promised to you in the job description or at the end of use or by whoever you had lunch with or whatever. That that's You're not owed that. If you go work someplace and it's a great place to work, you locked out. That's awesome. Good for you. If it's not and you can afford to leave, leave. If you can't afford to leave, grind it out until you can. But you are not owed a great place to work. Ooh. 10 points for making this very tweetable. Uh, it's very short uh, and very to the point. That's really good. Anybody else has an unpopular wait, 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 I need, I need like a, I need like a definition of great here. What do, what do you mean great? Like this can be something that is very individual he's to like, each He's one. like basic human rights. Yeah. <laughs> You're not, oh, that. Shelter, water. A bathroom. <laughs> No, I'm kidding. <laughs> I like one. That's a good one. That very got everybody moving. That's that's your <laughs> unpopular opinion. Can anybody? I mean, I still, I still need. I need a little bit more from Johnny there. I need, I need. We we can do this in the after episode. <laughs> mm, right. Okay, fine. Okay, fine. Uh, I have, I have one. Um, that might be equally actually. No, I'm gonna, I'm gonna phrase this so it's just as spicy. Mm. Um, <laughs> so I, I read the quote unquote waterfall paper. And I will say that the method of doing engineering described in that paper is far superior to anything that we're doing today. Oh, that's also very tweetable. Also, great job. I heard a waterfall is superior. Is superior than to, to all. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. That's what that that might be. What you heard is that what I said? <laughs> that's what you heard, though. Oh, you're playing games now. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I had like a pretty a pretty safe one, which I'll start with because it's really safe. But my safe one was that uh, Johnny needs a dog. So that's my opinion. <laughs> and Johnny vote is about that. notoriously <laughs> against pets. So I just want to stake my flag. On that is that. an unpopular opinion. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> that's my small one. But no, Chris, this whole episode... Don't tweet this one. Tweet out Johnny needs a dog. <laughs> the, the second one is this whole episode I was thinking and I was like, I, I don't know when I could pepper this. But I kept thinking Agile was developed by neurotypicals. I'm not totally serious with that opinion, <laughs> but it does feel that way. <laughs> like, the whole episode. Wow. I was like, it's so neurotypical. <laughs> like, wow. <laughs> so don't tweet that one, please. <laughs> Dude, Johnny needs a pet. <laughs> but okay, if you listen okay. to this episode, you can hear... A slightly hot take <laughs> from me. Oh, <laughs> interesting. So follow up, Chris. <laughs> Shots fired over here. <laughs> it will be like a secret, unpopular opinion. And in, ca- in case, in case it was, in case anybody is confused, that was definitely an insult, right? That was. Not- <laughs> There are moments when I sit around <laughs> saying that was very neurotypical and it's, it might not always be nice. That, that's not meant as a compliment about agile. Yeah. That's like saying millennial, but actually meal old people. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I don't really mean that opinion, but I think it regularly <laughs> is probably where I stand. Uh, you, so you do mean it, you just don't verbalize it. <laughs> I would... Uh, yeah, I put some heavy asterisks on it, but the yeah, th- there's a whole hot take that could be a, a little blog post on that <laughs> and why the similarities are there. <laughs> I, I also just translated that into like other like uh, privileged groups. It's like you know what? If, if I said it's invented by uh, no, that yeah, though that that feels like. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> okay, I have an unpopular opinion as well. I hope it's an unpopular one. Um, you should hide anybody who is a. Uh, writing more than two or three tweets on using FOMO. This is a, this is very, from my personal context, the uh, world of context, uh, obviously lots of AI things, and there's lots of good, interesting content there, but unfortunately there's a lot more. You won't believe what happened this week. AI killed um, all the world developers. Uh, if you don't use this tool, you will lose your job. Mute. Those people, like two of those tweets, hide. Don't think. Hi. Just mute all of them. Mm. Mute anything you do, whatever your 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 choices. I've, I I would expand that to include anybody who starts with anything AI. Here's a threat. <laughs> Johnny's like, I actually already muted them. He's like, Do you want my block list? <laughs> I've got I've got it. I think last year there was like a, 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 a bit of a um like hype against threads, and I think it's still legit. Like, there's very few threads that should be threads. 
Oh, that's so annoying. Yeah. Yeah. I, I do the not interested, don't show me anything like this, please. Um, it does it work? No. <laughs> right. <laughs> as, it, as it works, it's a certain date, uh, uh, I think. <laughs> yeah. But no, it, it, it is, is easy to start, you know, tracking that. It's like, you know, the irony of the blue check mark and that it was like a very notable thing in the past and it's still a notable thing mm-hmm. now. Like, I know when I'm scrolling through those replies, which tweets I am not going to read. Mm-hmm. And I feel like if, if it says AI in the first few words of a tweet, that's a thread I'm not clicking on. So I think we're getting these good signals. <laughs> I would just rather it not be in my timeline at all. Yeah, there's very little AI content that is good to read and actually gives you value rather than give you this feeling of... <gasps> Yeah, anxiety. I'm missing out. I'm like, anxiety. So much. I guess this is another unpopular opinion. Sign up to my newsletter. But like, I feel like AI is exactly like cryptocurrency. Like, I feel mm. that the underlying technology. That is an unpopular opinion. You can also tweet. That's the yeah. one. That's that's, that's the good, one. That's but good. it's like that, uh, yeah. uh, that doesn't mean that doesn't mean all they all have to come from one, you know from different shows. We can, we can space this out. You can have two and more <laughs> yeah. two, two and one. <laughs> that was a good. Video. But it's like it's like I was thinking about this the other day where I'm like blockchain as a technology is actually absolutely incredible. Like I think from a distributed systems perspective, like to do to nerd out for a second, right? Uh, the thing about Byzantine fault tolerant distributed system consensus algorithms, uh, which is what blockchain is, is usually you have a lower threshold of the number of nodes that can fail to make it secure. And blockchain as a technology has figured out how to effectively get you up to. which is the same tolerance you have for every other type of consensus, right? You can't have consensus with more than 50% of your nodes failing. And I'm like, it's incredible. We actually made some major ground and have proven that this type of system can work and can function even with adversaries. That is incredible. And it is tragic that is it attached to something that is so horrible, right? Like even if you like cryptocurrency in general, the current state of it with the scams and the Ponzi schemes and people losing their life savings, it's a disaster. And I, I feel like the same thing about AI. Like I feel like AI, the underlying technology is really interesting, really cool. That thing it's attached to, the AI, the name AI, the brand AI, no, like I could do without it. Please, just. And that's why Apple in their uh, announcement only said ML. Yeah, they did not say it. They said they said you know we're using these models. You're using this. We're doing we're using transformers, right? Like yeah, like talking about the tools. Tools are cool. I think the AI tools, like the the tooling, the thing that builds it, that stuff is cool. I don't I don't like the branding. So three unpopular opinions in one episode. Thank you, Chris. Mm. <laughs> thanks also Johnny and thanks also Kaylin. It was a really interesting conversation. I hope everybody who listened to this learned and um, thank you for also being open to talk about this. It's obviously not very simple. So it's it's great and it's helpful for everybody. And thanks everybody who joined. Yeah, thank you. All right, that is go time for this week. Thanks for listening. Have you heard about our recent refresh of the Changelog podcast? It is now three shows in one. Changelog News on Mondays, our classic interview on Wednesdays, and on Fridays, a brand new talk show for your weekend listening. It's like putting the hallway track at your favorite conference on repeat all year round. So if you haven't listened to the Changelog in a bit, now's a good time to give it another go. Thanks once again to our partners for helping us bring you awesome developer pods each and every week. Check them out at Fastly.com, Fly.io, and Typesense.org. And thank you, of course, to the mysterious Breakmaster Cylinder for producing every beat on every Changelog podcast. That is all for now, but we'll talk to you again next time on Go Time.